The first details of Destiny 2 were released and there's plenty of minutia to sift through if you're so inclined. YouTube channels like Arix Gaming and Dado Does Destiny have done a great job of breaking this info down, so if you'd like to get into the nitty gritty then I'd really recommend checking them out. If you're a fan of The Crucible then the trash tier YouTuber and personal frenemy The Jez has also just put out a passable video on all the changes we can expect coming to The Crucible. I've left links to all of that stuff in the description below, do check it out if you Keen. Today, I'd like to do something a little different. I'd like to explore the newly emerging design pillars on which Destiny 2 is being built. A lot of people are saying that Destiny 2 is little more than DLC, but the fact is that just isn't true. There are some very large changes coming to core game systems, and I think that speaking about the high level shifts in direction does a better job of highlighting the difference between the two games, rather than just comparing the individual detail of bullet points one by one. It's a classic case of seeing the forest for the trees, or the changes being greater than the sum of their parts. The way I see it, there are in fact three large-scale thematic and mechanical shifts that Bungie are driving in Destiny 2. They are the evolution of the player power fantasy, new and improved social systems, and finally a revitalized solo player experience delivered through a new approach to open world design and improved storytelling. There's a lot to be said on each of these topics and I plan to do a separate video on each of them. This first video I want to talk about the evolution of the player power fantasy, in the second video I'd like to talk about the evolution of the social systems that I've actually had a chance to interview the lead social designer M.E. Chung as part of that so I'm really looking forward to sharing that video with you and the third video will look at the evolution of the solo experience but that won't come until after E3 where I've had the chance to interview one or two more developers to really round out my view on that topic. So let's get into part one now. Having spent about 5 hours hands on with Destiny 2, the biggest shift I'm seeing between 1 and 2 is the increased focus on the player power fantasy. Now for those that don't know, the term player power fantasy is a video games term relating to the way that gameplay makes us feel powerful. In a game like Dark Souls for example, you're specifically made to feel weak and fragile. In a game like Infamous however, you're basically a god. The player power fantasy here is one where you are constantly constantly in control of all of your circumstances. You have maximum agency at all times, and it feels pretty damn good. Destiny has always done a fantastic job of delivering on the core player power fantasy. You bring down most of your targets quickly, you're armed with powerful weapons and abilities that feel good to use, there's plenty of aim assist to make you feel more accurate in combat than you really are, and there's of course your super abilities, which are those big explosions of power at regular intervals. But in Destiny 2, Bungie wanted make you feel even more powerful, and they're upping the ante across pretty much every part of the player power spectrum. I think the most notable example of this is the changes to supers. From what we've seen, it's clear that Bungie are committed to making our supers feel more like big, huge, destructive explosions of roaming power, rather than short-term explosions of power or utility. Take the Warlock for example. Previously, Warlock's Sunsinger class had an extremely useful super ability, Radiance, which when specced properly, enabled you to self-resurrect something extremely powerful in hard mode raid content content where revives were not available. From what we can tell, this ability is now gone, replaced by the flaming death from above super, which now functions in a very similar way to the current Titan's Hammer of Soul. The statement here is pretty clear, Bungie have pushed the super from this passive, utility focused res to the more active death and destruction of the flame sword. It's a consistent theme with other supers as well. The Titan may or may not have the Ward of Dawn come Destiny 2 despite Zavala showcasing it during the cinematic. It's that big bubble that you see here. The Void spec now offers the Captain America style shield, which allows the Titan to roam around and shoulder charge people or throw it as a projectile. The Void spec was what gave us the Ward of Dawn before, and it's very possible that this ward won't be making a return because it doesn't align with this new model of supers being active roaming abilities that focus on destructive power. The Titan's Fist of Havoc is another example of this new design philosophy. Where before it was a single use and fairly underpowered ability, now the Titan remains charged for a duration of time and can use it multiple times. The quintessential nuke super has now become a roaming super. 
And it's the same for Hunters as well, whose Golden Gun ability used to grant only 3 shots, but can now grant up to 6 shots as you continue to fan the hammer, giving you more time to roam around and take out foes. These are big changes to the most defining aspects of the class, their supers. From what we can tell, the utility focused supers that we were so reliant upon for raid mechanics may be gone. Regardless of whether or not they are gone, it's clear that Bungie's designers have decided that supers need to deliver a better and more lasting destructive fantasy, with their power being metered out over time rather than in a single use. It remains to be seen how good all of these changes will be, as this certainly constitutes a large shift away from the existing class identities. The other way that Destiny is doubling down on the player power fantasy is through a significant streamlining of its RPG systems. Watch pretty much any successful RPG and observe how its RPG systems become more and more streamlined and simplified with each subsequent iteration. It's a common theme from things like Dragon Age to Fallout to World of Warcraft. Game designers not only strip away the chaff to focus on what's important, but they also look to simplify things to make the game more accessible to a wider audience. For my money, this is just as often a bad thing as it is a good thing, as I almost always value more complexity rather than less, and I think that the three games I've just listed are perfect examples of what can go wrong when you go too far in hollowing out core RPG systems. In the case of Destiny, the concept of a build has been pretty core to the player experience for a long time, at least to the hardcore player experience. Those chasing top tier gear stats, god rolled weaponry and the perfect combination of subclass talents for their content of choice have always had plenty of options. And while some of those options have been more an illusion of choice rather than actual choice, there was always enough meat on the bone for Destiny to be considered a proper RPG for those that know how to build and play properly. That's very much gone here in Destiny 2. The range of weapon talents we're seeing seem to be in the same ballpark, but the core strength, agility, and intellect stats that we knew before are gone, replaced with stats that we used to get from our gear like armor and recovery. More than this, the subclass talent trees have been clustered together, so that you now have to choose clusters of talents rather than choosing a collection of talents across a much broader spectrum. It's a great change for more casual players who want to jump into the action and not overthink things, but it's a bit disappointing for the more hardcore fans who appreciate the ability to pick and choose what works well for them. And in case it isn't clear, more simple RPG systems are about the player power fantasy, because they essentially remove one of the barriers between less knowledgeable players and their making the right decisions to do well. If RPG systems offer fewer options, then there's really no wrong choice and the player is going to feel more powerful more often. Whether or not you agree with this change, and I'm certainly very skeptical about it, its intent is certainly to make the player feel more powerful more often, regardless regardless of the decisions they make. By far and away, the biggest change to the core combat loop in Destiny 2 are the new abilities that have been added to each class. The Warlock will drop an AoE heal or a damage boost depending on how you spec it. The Hunter will do a fancy shade step which will actually reload your weapon. And the Titan will drop a big wall in front of him, allowing him to peek over the top of it and fire from cover. These are powerful moments on long cooldowns and they give the player more opportunities to react to circumstances and demonstrate mastery. They aren't lazy stat boost buffs, they are active abilities that shift your camera to third person when you activate them, just like your super does, and they make you feel really awesome when you use them, I can tell you that from personal experience. Bungie have always been masters of the player power fantasy. One need only look at the whole one man army feeling you get when you're playing Halo to see how deeply Bungie understand this idea. And Bungie are evolving this formula further this time around with Destiny 2. Some of the changes are unquestionably excellent such as better supers and new player abilities, while some of them such as the streamlining of RPG stats will warrant a more wait and see approach. Either way, it's a design pillar that we can see Bungie are clearly buttressing and it's a clear evolution from Destiny 1 into Destiny 2. I think the last area where Bungie are looking to evolve the player power fantasy is through their weapons. Now, uh, weapons are changing in a very big way in Destiny 2. 
There's two new weapon types. There's the SMG and the grenade launcher. But more important than this, Bungie are revising the weapon slot system. You'll now use a kinetic weapon in your primary slot that just fires normal bullets. And your secondary slot will now hold what they're calling energy weapons, which are identical to primary weapons. So it's things like hand cannons and assault rifles and that sort of thing. But they have elemental damage on them like solar, void or arc. This slot also no longer contains sniper rifles, fusion rifles and shotguns. These have been moved to the third slot which is now called your power slot. Alongside swords, rocket launchers and machine guns, this slot is now designed to give you those big power advantage moments when you have the ammo for them. The approach to kinetic and energy weapons makes a lot of sense for a lot of reasons and most people are really on board with this change. But a lot of people have some very big questions about why Bungie has gone down this path with power weapons. Especially given that in PvP if one person picks up the power weapon ammo, only they get it. The ammo is no longer shared between people in the nearby vicinity. The power weapon model ultimately has two objectives. Firstly, it aims to balance out the primacy of shotguns and sniper rifles in the Crucible. Bungie have essentially given up on trying to balance these weapons since they are inherently the best choice in most circumstances unless you nerf the weapon so hard that it becomes useless in almost all circumstances. See the current state of shotguns in the Crucible right now. By moving these existing secondary weapons into the power slot, they throttle the available ammo, thereby making us less reliant on them in PvP. Secondly, and in tandem with this, Bungie planned to make power ammo more readily available more often. I felt it a lot when I was playing through the strike and campaign mission. Power ammo was dropping all the damn time, and in the Crucible, the power ammo drop box has a much shorter cooldown than it had in the past. The net effect of all of this is that you won't be using a shotgun as much as you used to in the vanilla game, but you'll definitely be using your rocket launcher a hell of a lot more. The intent is that players will likely have to make more educated decisions about which powerful weapon they plan to bring to the fight and build around that playstyle while chasing ammo, rather than just having your shotgun in your back pocket and being reliant upon it all the time whenever you get close to an enemy, or being reliant upon the rocket launcher whenever you happen to have any heavy ammo. It's a very, very big shift versus what we're seeing today, and once again, we need to wait and see what impact this has on PvE, but in particular on PvP balance. As I said earlier, Bungie really have mastered the art of the player power fantasy. They've proved it in Destiny 1 and they're going further in Destiny 2. I think most of these changes are very positive and I'm really looking forward to seeing how they're implemented. But of course, these aren't the only changes that they're bringing to Destiny 2. In the next video, I'm going to be talking about the evolution of social systems and that will include my interview with Emmy Chung, the social lead for Bungie. And in the third video, we're going to be talking about the evolution of the solo experience and how that relates to things like the story, the world building and matchmaking.